Hi everyone, it's Guillaume from Startup Basecamp. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. During the show, you will have the opportunity to meet the best climate tech founders, investors, and experts from both Silicon Valley and around the globe. They will share with you their stories and personal journeys into this growing and exciting industry, giving you some insights into the ecosystems that help you to take part in the fight against climate change and benefit from the opportunities it can represent. The podcast is divided in two small interviews. During the first part, you will get to know our speakers, their perspectives on the climate crisis and how climate tech is changing the game. Second part of the discussion will be for members of our community who will learn the speaker's secret sauce on how to and share with you their unique expertise on topics such as fundraising, management, strategy and so on to help you to become a better leader in your field. So before we start, I would like to quickly share what we are doing at Startup Basecamp to support climate tech founders in accessing resources and gaining visibility with investors they seek. Our initiatives include a membership-based community platform offering access to a dedicated Slack group with a growing number of founders, experts, and investors from around the world, and a series of exclusive content such as interviews, weekly job listings, events, and our quarterly online pitch of night opportunity. But more than a place where you can learn, exchange, and grow, we are building a matchmaking service to facilitate connections between our members and top investors and experts in the field. And soon, alongside with other top investors, we will be launching a small fund to co-invest in the growth and acceleration of our members. Finally, all of this is possible because of your support and donations. We are a small self-funded team and we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. So please share one episode with a friend and subscribe to the channels. As an added bonus, we will plant a tree for each of our subscribers each time we reach 1,000 new fans or donors. Do not hesitate to connect with me via social media or email Guillaume at Startup Basecamp. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope to get in touch with you soon. And now let's go for the show. Hi everyone, during this episode of Founder Series, we sat down with Alex Bloom, who has developed a way to mix sustainable plant fibers with durable plastics that are either virgin, recycled, or bioplastics to enable their use in standard manufacturing and substantially reduce their cost and carbon footprint. It was fascinating to sit down with Alex, who speaks with such a passion about his journey as a successful tech salesman turned philanthropist and no entrepreneur. In 2017, sensitive to the humanitarian crisis of the Rohingya's population, Alex decided to take action and flew to Bangladesh with a film crew to produce two award-winning documentaries showcasing the crisis with the world. The trip led him to learn about new plant-based cellulose technologies that could be used in the construction industry, especially for better refugee shelters. Although the company has since shifted from this initial model toward producing pellets for manufacturers that are decarbonized through their plant fiber mix, they still make houses for refugees that are sustainable, not only by reducing the material carbon footprint, but by using local material and labor to construct them. During this episode, Alex took me on a deep dive into the plastics industry to learn how the market works, who the main players are, why there is a trail of dead bodies in the bioplastic space, and what Alex is doing differently. In doing so, we dove into technicalities of plastic, it, its regulation and market, and what role it plays in the global economy. In the second part of the show, Alex shares his tips for fundraising, especially in the current economic climate. He also gives some great book recommendations and his unconventional view on work-life balance. Alex, welcome to the show. Hi, Alex. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. I'm super happy to have you here with us today. I believe it's going to be a great opportunity to hear your story and learn more about your exciting adventure with applied bioplastics. I mean, you guys are on a mission uh, to supply the world with uh, 
economically sustainable plant-based plastic alternatives and at scale, I hope. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you having me on today. So that's the tradition here on the show. I uh, would love to hear like a 30 second uh, introduction about applied bioplastics. Certainly. Um, so essentially what we're addressing is, is durable plastics and polymers. Um, you look at the economic expansion driven by those things, um, you know, over the last century, you've got planes, trains, automobiles, toys, tools, technology, all of them cheaper and lighter and more accessible to more people. You know, plastic's an amazing invention um, and it's everywhere and demand for it is still growing. But um, it, it's pretty terrible for the environment. About two kilograms of CO2 are emitted for every kilogram of plastic that we create. So what Applied Bioplastics does is we figured out a way to mix sustainable plant fibers uh, with durable plastics, both uh, virgin, recycled, and bioplastics uh, to both reduce their cost, enable their use in, in standard manufacturing uh, uh, processes, and uh, substantially reduce their carbon footprint. So let's start from the from the top. Uh, we like on this show to really like first focus on the on the speaker and the guest uh, at first as as a person. Uh, so we'd like to to hear a little bit from you. Like I mean, what are you passionate about? Like what's your story and background? I mean, what do you love to do besides building applied bioplastics? I mean, what makes you feel inspired or you your best self? Uh, as I always ask, like who is Alex? Certainly, I appreciate that question. Um, often these interviews are just business, business, business. But um, I, I think our story is really important. And, um, you know, it, it is what drives me and inspires me to this day. So um, I, I'm an old school sales guy. It's, it's what I spent most of my career doing. Worked for uh, Oracle and Amazon, uh, Thousand Eyes, which was bought by Cisco, WP Engine, um, primarily just selling technology. And I got really good at it over the last decade or so. And in 2017, I closed my entire annual quota in the first uh, like two months of the fiscal year, which resulted in just an enormous uh, commission check. I think that year I'd made uh, about three quarters of a million dollars in, in just sales commissions. Um, and as a 27 year old, I said to myself, I, you know, I don't need all this, um, especially after paying off my debts. I'm an American millennial, which means I had, you know, college debt, other things like that. Um, and, and so, you know, I wanted to do something meaningful other than, you know, sales, which is good for enriching yourself, uh, slightly enriching the founder of your company. Uh, perhaps if you've got a good solution, it saves other companies money, but it, you know, that's it, not really what makes me tick. I'm not inspired by that. Um, so I, I decided to do what feels good, which for me is, is charity. Um, so, you know, once I, I had, uh, I had gotten those commission checks, I, I started dispersing them to, to things that I cared about. Um, you know, the first one was, uh, uh, mobile loaves and fishes here in Austin, Texas. It serves hot meals to the homeless. Uh, the second was an ongoing initiative, uh, to add a common sense, uh, uh, you know, no obligation uh, way for gun owners uh, to to run background checks on their buyers here in Texas. So really middle of the road, common sense, everybody can get behind it. Um, you know, started an advocacy group behind that. Um, and then a friend of mine from from college um, reached out to me, and this is still in 2017, and told me that um, that uh, two million people had crossed the border into his country of Bangladesh, um, you know, all in about two or three weeks. And, and he didn't know what was going on. He just knew that these people needed help. Um, and, and asked me if that was something I was interested in. Now, I am uh, ethnically Hebrew. Um, you know, my, my people suffered a, a secret genocide, uh, you know, almost a century ago. So uh, those don't sit well with me personally. Uh, so I decided to go do something about what, what turned out to be the Rohingya genocide. So I, I booked a flight. I flew to Bangladesh um, to, to see what I could do to help with about a quarter of a million dollars. And I realized when I got there, you know, the answer was not much. Um, you know, this is a major geopolitical issue. It's two million people. Um, and, and so what I decided to spend my capital on was um, informing the rest of the world on what was happening. Um, and so, you know, I hired a crew. Uh, together, we filmed two documentaries in the world's largest refugee camp. One of them but won a Best Short uh, Documentary Award in London. Uh, the other one won the World Fest International down in Houston, where it was picked up by Amazon. And, and we got the word out about what was occurring, um, you know, in, in Bang or, well, in Myanmar. And, and as a result, uh, you know, the refugees were fleeing to Bangladesh. While I was there, I was, I was introduced to a Bangladeshi scientist by the name of uh, Dr. Mubarak Ahmed Khan. Um, Dr. Khan had come up with a really fascinating idea, uh, which was the preservation of plant cellulose uh, 
um, in, in the format of adding it to plastic. Um, what he had there uh, was, was this fairly simple material compared to what we make today. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the screen. Um, we call this better board. Um, and it is simply burlap resin, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a, you know, a bit blurry here, but um, it's simply burlap in resin, uh, but with a preservative that makes the burlap bond correctly with the resin and, and thus creates a composite that can last for 30 to 50 years. Um, and I thought this was amazing. You know, this, this fits right inside my, um, my personal thesis that, you know, we, we've got the solutions, um, you know, worldwide. Humans have been around for, you know, quarter million years, right? We, we have solved the problems that we're having today in the past uh, with, with simpler and, and, and more, um, uh, you know, common sense solutions. And this seems like a pretty common sense solution. You've got a resin, it needs to be stiffened. Cellulose is a great stiffening agent if you can preserve it. So let's preserve the cellulose and use it to stiffen uh, plastics. And, and, you know, the, the, the use for that is housing. Um, it's it's very inexpensive. Um, it's it's mostly plant matter, so it's it's cheap and it's green. Um, and so I wanted to start a company that housed refugees. Um, now, the the company has taken a bunch of twists and turns. We now make uh, uh, pellets for manufacturers that are decarbonized in the same way by adding those plant fibers. However. Um, we still do the original invention. So about a year ago, we deployed our first two villages uh, made of this material to the victims of the Rohingya genocide. Um, we just got a survey back recently saying that they have ridden out three monsoon seasons, uh, you know, a summer full of heat, uh, you know, and, and they're comfortable. They, they like th these houses much better than tents. Um, and, and further, those, those houses, what they do is essentially they, instead of taking aid dollars and sending them far away to go buy supplies for these refugees, we put the aid dollars directly into the local community because we're buying uh, both materials and labor from the local community. So those aid dollars create this virtuous cycle. Um, they stay in the local economy, they enrich the people, um, and, and they produce housing at the same time. So housing and jobs uh, are the result of this technology. So that's really what gets me going is, is you know, I don't plan on having kids, um, you know, I, I see that, um, you know, my my legacy as a person um, and, and just to get a little personal here, you know, I, I um, recently discovered I have an autoimmune disorder that's probably going to shorten my life. Um, you know, so so kids are kind of not in the in the in the cards for me, um, but I want to leave a mark regardless. And, and I think that um, giving people dignified housing. Um, is, is one of the most impactful things that you can do. Giving people jobs is one of the most impactful things you can do. Um, so that's what really gets me going. I mean, obviously we have the mission to decarbonize the world in the plastic industry. Um, I think that we can make a huge impact there. Uh, but when I look at photos and, and see videos and, you know, get to actually visit and, and hear these people talking about how, you know, that their roof doesn't leak anymore and um, and they're they're warm in the winter and, and cool in the summer um, and, and feel like they actually have a home, even though they've been displaced and are in an unfamiliar country. Um, that that's what really drives me that 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 inspires me. Thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, sharing all of that and literally like I mean listening to you we definitely uh, understand that uh, you are someone with a with a big heart uh, at the same time so able to uh, to sell uh, efficiently uh, you know IT products uh, but also uh, your vision and uh, and what uh, what you want to achieve there but uh, during this uh, this whole journey from from sales to uh, uh, activist uh, to be uh, also so involved into uh, you know uh, trying to, to support uh, refugees and, uh, and and people suffering around the world um, what has been like maybe the one or two uh, uh, piece of uh, experience that in a way gave you an edge to uh, uh, to start and, and go fund applied uh, bioplastics? I think that it is an intersection of opportunity, uh, privilege, and then let's be honest here. I'm a you know I'm a, a white presenting, straight presenting male in the United States. That gives me a lot of advantages. Um, you know, as a, as a result of those advantages, I, I have capital sources that I can draw upon as well. So I'm not sitting here saying, oh, just go change the world and chase your passions because, you know, for some people, they don't have uh, the, the advantages that I had uh, going into this. Um, but, you know, I, I guess uh, the, the big thing for me was what I described earlier with regard to a lack of purpose around increasing the profit margin for a business that I worked for, 
right? Um, or, or enriching myself. Um, I, I've been comfortable financially since I was about 25. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want for, for much of anything. Um, and I think that it is incumbent upon us, those of us who, who do hold that privilege um, by, by virtue of the way the world is today, uh, to, to give back, you know, to, and not to get to self-actualization through giving back, not to dust off your laurels, but, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us as a species. We're a tribal species, um, you know, and, and you've got these Pleistocene monkeys uh, that have all these complex systems and, you know, social media now and all that good stuff. And there's a million ways to feel good. Um, but I think what makes me feel best and, and what's really transformed me into a CEO and, and somebody who wants to go out and, and better the world um, is that realizing that we are one big tribe. You know, we, we, we evolved this way to be in these small family units. We've we've kind of forced ourselves to identify with larger and larger groups um, as our society has grown more interconnected. But when it comes down to it, we're all the same species. We're all the same tribe. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it, it takes all of us uh, to to, you know, bring dignity, work um, and and um, and life. To, to the rest of us on the planet, right? So um, I think that if you have the privilege, uh, I think that if you have the resources, um, you can you can be like me, um, you know, and, and if you don't, I encourage you to try anyways, because um, we, we need all of you. Thank you so much, Alex. So now that you know a bit more about, uh, about you uh, and your uh, deeper uh, motivation and uh, really like, uh, you know, spending time and all of your effort and resource on, uh, on Applied Bioplastic, b before we go into the, the company, we'd like to, to take a zoom out uh, and try to understand the, the overall context that uh, you're evolving on. So let's try to get your overview on the so-called green friendly bio sustainable plastic industry today uh, i'd like to to get maybe and start with your insights and data points regarding how large is the bioplastics uh, industry today i mean what are we talking about here in terms of value in terms of tons and compared to the, the traditional um, you know plastic uh, oil based uh, traditional industry uh, what is the percentage that it represent today if you could tell us a little bit more about like what uh, is the, the, the state today and what is the, the projection uh, that uh, uh, people are making uh, into that, uh, that specific industry? Certainly. So, you know, the, the plastics industry today is largely monolithic. I mean, it, it's broken up into a bunch of different companies. You've got your, you know, super major oil and gas producers. Um, you, you have your master batch companies, your compounders um, and your injection molders. But they're all working off of the same template, which is, you know, like petroleum based plastics. Right. Um, and, and that's hard to change. Um, you know, I had an investor ask me recently, uh, if it was possible to make an entirely new material, um, you know, instead of making a plastic composite, like we make today, but he, he visited a, um, a shell plant, like one of the super majors, um, and totally changed his tune. He realized how much money and infrastructure are invested into the current way of doing things. And so what that presents is a, is a challenge. Uh, for disruption to the market, right, is, is that, you know, there's hundreds of billions of dollars of equipment dedicated uh, to, to using plastic the way we use it today. Um, and so new entrants into the market find themselves, if they, if they require any sort of specialized machinery, any sort of specialized processing, handling, anything like that, um, they find their, themselves locked out of the industry because, you know, these, these processes are so ingrained um, and are really, really expensive to change. Um, so unless you can offer immediate savings of like 50%, which nobody can do today, um, nobody's going to rip and replace billions of dollars of equipment just because you have a better polymer. So um, we're kind of stuck as a as a species on this plastic because nobody's willing to spend the money to, to change. Um, and, you know, this is not a moral judgment. It, it is a lot of money uh, that that um, that would need to be put into making a serious change. And nobody can agree on what the new standard is. I mean, there's a there's a number of new standards. There's a number of uh, pure bioplastics that are out there. And to answer your question, you know, those bioplastics are really only nibbling the edges of a, of a huge market. I mean, we're talking about like three trillion dollars a year in plastics. 
Um, you know, I would say that in general, um, you know, we as a species are doing a better job with replacements for single use plastic and that like there's, you know, biodegradable bags, there's, um, you know, compostable bags, uh, there's water soluble bags, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we're really struggling with water bottles, which is a major thing, especially in, you know, Southeast Asia where, where the water isn't safe to drink. So you have to drink bottled water, um, that contributes a ton to trash. Um, but there's a lot of drawbacks on even the current solutions, right, for those single use plastics. Um, one of them in particular is the biodegradation process, which releases methane. So, you know, while you may be, you know, helping solve the trash issue as a biodegradable plastic, um, you, you still have other issues like like emissions, right? You know, methane substantially worse than CO2, uh, you know, for, for heating and cooling of the globe. Um, so as a result, um, you know, I, I would caution folks on saying that, you know, the silver bullet has been invented. Why don't we just all use, you know, compostable bags? Why don't we just all use biodegradable bags? It, it's hard. Um, you know, it, it's hard to break into that market. Number one, the, you know, polymer, you know, standard polymer bags are extraordinarily cheap. Uh, which is why they're so ubiquitous. Um, but, you know, there's also the end of life concerns and those those end of life concerns are really concerning to me um, because I think there's a temptation in the market to greenwash. Like you've got, um, you know, a solution, you're really excited about it. Um, you've got some investors on board, you've got some customers convinced, but, um, you know, I think a lot of founders kind of lose sight of, you know, the end goal, which is, you know, how do we save the planet? Uh, and, and, you know, when your personal finances are tied up in the success of your, you know, particular solution, it's really hard for people to back off and say, Hey, uh, you know, I don't think my product is actually a net positive for the world. I need to do something else. Um, so that, that's a real challenge. I mean, that's just human nature. There's, you know, a little bit of self-interest. So double click a little bit on the the, the, the defense uh, you know solution and, and alternative or technology that are existing today i mean can you maybe give us like uh, uh, besides uh, your solution that will go a little bit more in detail uh, after that but what is existing today it's really true try to to help the, the the listeners here the audience to really kind of like grasp like we kind of get to understand like the size of the market like the force in place that are just really like blocking uh, eventually some some changes but uh, what is existing because yeah as you mentioned we keep hearing uh, on a regular basis uh, in our feeds uh, in the news about this silver bullet uh, you know applied uh, you know plastics or whatever that gonna help us to uh, finally get rid of these uh, mountains of trash that we have everywhere but what is existing? I mean, you are in the in the field. Uh, you probably see your competitors and evolving. So maybe it's time to also tell the, t t tell us a bit like what are ex the one, two, three technologies without naming anyone, but that is existing and that uh, is promising that hopefully can open uh, step by step, uh, you know, the, the, the path to a cleaner world. Certainly. So, you know, the, the first one is the total conversion of cellulose uh, durable plastics makers. So, um, you know, cellulose is the most abundant natural resource on the planet. Um, the, the planet makes um, over a trillion metric tons of it uh, uh, per year, well more than what we need. Um, and, and so, you know, there are companies that are gasifying the cellulose, um, liquefying it, and then, uh, you know, condensating it down into a, a bioplastic resin. Um, that's a really neat idea. Um, it's basically plastic from nothing. Um, but there's some huge drawbacks. First one is um, the facilities that are necessary to create this type of plastic are very expensive in the, in the tens to, to hundreds of millions of dollars. All custom equipment take forever to scale. Um, and, and as a result, you know, you got to pay your investors back or your your banks back for your business loan to start those facilities. So as a result, the 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 cost of those those biomaterials is typically three to five hundred percent the cost of commodity plastic. Um, really hard to gain adoption uh, globally when you're three to five times as expensive. Um, you know, applied bioplastics looks to solve that particular issue by um, partnering with those uh, biomaterials makers. Um, we've actually got a proof of concept going on right now with um, with one of them and are setting up a second one uh, that enables us to mix our inexpensive plant fiber with their really expensive biomaterial, hopefully creating a composite that is closer to competitive uh, with those commodity plastics. So that's one, the um, the the gasification of cellulose uh, for, for, you know, 
for use in plastics creation. Um, there's actually, sorry, there's another downside of that one as well, which is power. Uh, the power required uh, to make those materials is often, um, you know, comparable uh, with creating virgin plastics. So from the creation side of things, um, you're not really saving anything in terms of emissions. Um, you know, as far as, um, you know, there's, there's a couple other things. So there's, there's um, you know, recycled plastics, which, um, you know, 95% of plastic is not recycled. Uh, it used to be 93%, but then China stopped uh, accepting our plastic waste. Um, you know, Greenpeace is out there saying that recycling is largely a scam perpetrated by the usual suspects, being the, you know, the big oil and gas companies, um, you know, leading consumers to believe that more types of plastic are recyclable than actually is true. Um, so th there's, you know, inherent problems with that. The other inherent problem with that is that um, the materials created from recycling are often um, less performant uh, and more expensive than what they're replacing. So, you know, there's there's a lot of demand for recycled plastics. Many companies want to get greener. Um, and as a result, you know, it's, it's actually more expensive today just due to supply and demand than those virgin plastics, which, you know, makes wider adoption more difficult. Um, and that's not to mention, of course, the the drawbacks on the the physical properties, right? Like um, the plastic is weaker, which means that it can't be used for as many applications as virgin plastics. Um, and, you know, again, this is something that we're looking to help solve. Um, you know, we attach our fibers to recycled plastic as well. Um, they don't bring them all the way back to virgin plastic, um, you know, uh, uh, physical properties, but they do bring them back, uh, you know, uh, higher up. Uh, so that they can be used for more use cases. So um, looking to help there. Also, again, cheap plant fibers into expensive plastic makes a inexpensive composite or at least a competitive composite. So we're looking to help with with that drawback uh, of, of those as well. Um, and then lastly is, um, you know, folks that are like us, but not, uh, you know, parallel with us. Uh, which is biocomposites. Um, now, biocomposites have been tried since the 1960s. I believe Mercedes uh, was the first company to try doing that. Um, they had a problem with the preservation of their cellulose. It began to rot in their um, in their composites, so they abandoned the science. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, you know a couple of other major plastics firms have tried uh, to incorporate plant fiber into their plastics and. You know, usually the fill rate is low or it requires changes to machinery uh, or, you know, it doesn't really uh, uh, have enough of a carbon benefit to really consider doing it at a wide scale uh, because, again, the, the, the fiber fill percentage is low, um, you know, and, and so just a, a general lack of competence in the industry uh, around um, the, uh, the um, uh, you know, ability to combine those two materials. So um, just to kind of recap here, we have recycled, uh, you know, formerly virgin polymer. Um, problems are, are physical properties and cost. Uh, pure biomaterials, uh, you know, hard to scale, expensive to scale, um, you know, cost and carbon footprint. Um, and then you've got uh, biocomposite makers, which uh, by and large are unsuccessful because the physical properties of their, their plastic aren't very good or the adhesion doesn't work permanently. So the, the, the shelf life of their plastics is poor um, or you know they're, they're not getting enough benefit because they're not mixing enough plant fiber because they haven't figured out how to do so successfully. So um, that's kind of the look at the, the durable plastics market. Of course, we could talk about the, the single use plastic market. I think that's also really interesting um, as I mentioned earlier, primarily the, um, the single use plastics um, are really cheap, uh, really easy to make. Uh, they're a bit harder uh, to make them out of biomaterials. There's some really interesting tech around using algae uh, to create um, water soluble uh, packaging, which is good for some situations and horrible for other situations like packaging food. If it's got moisture, it's going to melt the plastic. Um, you know, there are, um, you know, cellulose and starch uh, uh, composites, which are also interesting, also typically uh, going to be water soluble, uh, but that it's going to leave, um, you know, it's going to be leaving cellulose everywhere, which is not necessarily an inherent problem, but it will result in, in some methane emissions as that um, as the, the, the plant fiber 
or degrades. Um, and then there are, um, you know, the compostable ones, which are a really great idea if anybody used compost piles, but, um, you know, getting user adoption. And by that, mean, I don't mean buying the bags. I mean, properly disposing of the bags. That's really difficult. Um, changing consumer behaviors is, is one of the hardest things you can do. Um, so, you know, a number of drawbacks in that space, uh, primary of which I believe is uh, the the issue about, um, uh, you know, changing that consumer behavior and, and the methane emissions. So if you take a, a zoom out here, like uh, more at the macro level in itself, do you see any like uh, country uh, that is or are, uh, I would say, the, the leaders in terms of like R&D in the space and production capabilities? As of today, do you see any like emerging leaders uh, today or like countries that are really like trying to push uh, the ball forward? Yeah, I think, I mean, the Eurozone in general has been doing a really good job of, of regulating away single-use plastics. Um, California as a state is doing a good job with that. You know, even some localities here in Texas, like where I live, Austin, Texas, has a bag ban, um, kind of trying to stop the bags at the source sort of thing. And, and I mean, honestly, that, that's, that's the best solution for grocery bags is to stop using them. Bring a backpack. Right. Like bring a cloth bag. Humans have been bringing cloth bags to the market for, you know, 250,000 years. Um, we need to go back to that. It was a good solution. You don't need a plastic bag. You don't need a biodegradable bag or compostable bag. You just need to bring your own bag. Um, that's how we stop that that plastic pollution in, in its tracks. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in Bangladesh and India. It's not that hard. I've seen people literally like tie up shirts so that they are you know, they turn into a bag right and they bring that to the market so if they can figure it out you can figure it out um, stop using plastic bags please and, and <laughs> most likely you know one day you go there they don't give you a bag next time you're gonna come back with a bag you know what i mean right so, exactly uh, yeah <laughs> that's that's one of those things with, with changing consumer behavior if you take away the option the consumer does have to change um so i'd like to see those i mean india like i said has, has gone ahead with the bag ban as well um which is why people are are bringing their own um, that is such an easy move uh, for, for nearly every government in the world to pursue. Um, I want to give credit to the Eurozone, some states in, in, and some localities in the U.S., uh, to India as a nation. I think uh, Bangladesh is working on or has passed a bag ban. Um, I'm not super familiar with uh, South America or African uh, policies, but I would assume that there's also uh, folks who are following this this proven policy. Um, but yeah, so that, that's one thing. The, the other thing is I, I want to give a special credit to, um, you know, the Eurozone and India for um, either considering or passing uh, regulations that uh, require biomaterials to be used in certain types of plastic. Like I know that there are some uh, European regulations around automotive plastics. They must contain some sort of bio or recycled material. Um, you know, I want to see more of that. I, I think, um, you know, uh, there, there are definitely a few leaders, but these are these are technologies that exist and are available to be used. Um, you know, sometimes they need to be subsidized to be to be um, you know viable nationwide um, in in any given nation. But I would like to point out um, that there's something we can do to make all plastics affordable relative uh, to to the virgin plastics that are out there today, um, and that is stop subsidizing petroleum exploration. Stop it. Like we 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 don't need that. Um, you know, what we do need is investment into the green sectors, into battery uh, technology, into battery substation technology, into transmission technology, um, wind and solar, um, you know, geothermal, nuclear, for Christ's sake. I mean, honestly, nuclear. I don't know why we abandoned that. Um, I understand that there were a lot of concerned activists. Yes, there have been accidents, but the technology's improved um, and, and it really needs to be pursued. Right. I mean, it, it's clean, free energy basically forever especially once we get to, to cold fusion. Um, so, you know, we need to see additional investment. But most importantly, I mean, like the thing that we can just stop doing is subsidizing oil. Um, that will make, you know, the, the quote unquote competitive price of, you know, of, of commodity plastic go up to where it normally should be, right? An unsubsidized version of that um, is, is what's healthier for the world because it, it inherently makes everything else compared to it more competitive um, if you're not artificially depressing that price. So, and, and, and I think this is a very interesting, uh, you know, conversation uh, going into that road, but I, li I like to go back a little bit more on the, on the plastics um, uh, side of it. Um, 
now that we know a bit better the, the, the general context, uh, thanks for, for sharing all of this uh, knowledge with, uh, with the audience here. So according to you, what needs to happen in a way to accelerate the deployment of uh, bioplastics? I mean, like uh, you mentioned some regulation on the you know Indian side, European side, uh, in California, for instance. Uh, is there is like, I mean, extra regulation that should be uh, put in place according to you or what is blocking really the uh, the acceleration of uh, of this movement and again uh, we can cover the, the the cost and the subsidiary uh, the, the subsidiary of uh, the the oil research and uh, and stuff like that but if we put that aside, like what can happen now? What is blocking uh, really the acceleration? Or maybe is the is the L and D still uh, struggling to to find like you know the, the right um, you know model to uh, to be viable at scale? I mean, according to you, what would be like the one, two, three steps that could really make a dent now uh, in the next uh, five to ten years? Certainly. So let, let's do this all within the frame of, of capitalism and and governments, um, you know, sort of playing favorites as far as as, um, you know, trying to incentivize behavior. Right. Because that's that's what really what we're talking about is public policy. So, you know, as I said earlier, first target is that oil subsidy that's got to go away. Um, it artificially lowers the true cost of plastic, uh, helps people forget about the environmental cost of plastic because it's so dang cheap. Right. Um, we got to stop that. Um, the second thing is is adding a subsidy for bioplastics um, to accelerate adoption by lowering prices, right? Like if governments want people to use biomaterials, they should help make them cheaper rather than helping make the thing that's damaging the earth cheaper, right? So let's just take that package of, in, of incentives on oil exploration, put it over here in bioplastics, um, you know enable us to subsidize that cost, enable manufacturers uh, to start using this polymer, right? Um, and, and that's for my polymer, right? Like that's for, you know, using the same equipment that you're currently using today. Let's acknowledge that the solution, the, the you know, the, the solution at the end of this century probably won't be a biocomposite. It probably will be a bioplastic. So um, what we need to do there is, is, you know, support the development of a bioplastic standard. Now there's, there's some standards, there's some standards in Europe, um, you know, there, there need to be global standards, number one. Um, and number two, we, we need to kind of decide on, on winners here, right? Like we can't have, you know, 25 different uh, types of bioplastic all competing for the exact same market. Um, you know, in theory, that drives competitiveness, drives prices down. Um, but in reality, um, what we need is a standardized, um, you know, set of equipment that everybody uses. That's what we have now uh, for virgin plastics and, and what we need for bioplastics. So we need to decide which of these polymers is the most sustainable, uh, the, the, you know, the easiest to create, the, the you know, the lowest cost to the environment. Um, and then we need to stick with them for a while, right? So we need to subsidize or at least assist, uh, you know, companies with tax credits on changing their infrastructure, right? Like it's sort of like the, the incentives for buying an electric car, right? Like the government wants people to stop buying gasoline cars and start buying electric cars. Cool. Take away the, you know, the new car uh, tax and put it all in uh, to, to electronic uh, uh, car uh, or like battery powered car uh, subsidies, right? So you, you kind of shift the consumer behavior through taxation. Um, I think you can do the same thing uh, for, for polymer consumers. You can, you can, um, you know, either add a subsidy uh, to make the the, the biomaterial super cheap or you can give tax credits uh, to ensure uh, that that uh, companies are swapping out their equipment for equipment that can more easily use sustainable materials but again that requires first um, you know deciding on which biomaterials are going to win right the reason applied bioplastics exists is because I have no faith that governments are going to do any of what I've just said um, and and so you know in a subsidy free environment um, you know, our plastics exist to help businesses get greener, even if they can't afford to rip and replace their processing equipment. Um, you know, the third one is is adding a, a global carbon tax uh, to help brands and consumers feel the gravity of the pollution that we're causing. I mean, you know, you could replace some of my previously proposed subsidies with this. Um, I think they should be done in concert. Um, but a carbon tax is, is super important, right? I mean, you know, we, we need to understand, we need the market to understand. And the only way you can do that is is um, through dollars, right? Is is you know if you're losing dollars because you're producing too much carbon, you will change. Um, and you being a business or or a, you know consumer, um, so if we can 
if we can get a carbon tax onto high carbon materials, um, you know, and, and onto fuels and everything else like that, um, you know, not only does that give governments more money to, to work on mitigation, which I'm hoping, and you know, I, I'm suggesting that that's what we do with the carbon tax money, right, is actually work on on solutions or, or put that money into subsidies uh, to, to help people make the switch. And eventually those things should balance out. Carbon tax goes away because everybody's using sustainable materials. Um, and then lastly, and I'm sorry, I've gone on for, for quite some time on this point, but I do have a lot of policy thoughts here. I'm a, you know, aspiring politician one day, hopefully. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm all about legacy and leaving, uh, leaving things better than I found them. But, um, you know, lastly and most importantly to me is, and, and Cap, Capitalists are going to hate to hear this, but, you know, it's it's the reality of the situation. The global nationalization of recycling plants. I actually have a few friends who are going to be upset with me for saying that. But um, look, recycling is inherently unprofitable. Um, it's inherently unprofitable due to several reasons. Primarily is process loss, right? When you put in a chunk of plastic, you lose a bunch of it in the course of it being recycled. Um, and then reduction in material utility. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, recycled plastics don't do well, um, you know, in, in, uh, in the same use cases that virgin plastics do. So they're less useful and you're losing a bunch of it. Um, the, the, the lower utility means that you can only sell it for a lower price. So as a result, you know, a plastics recycling plant is receiving a bunch of plastic, spending money on, on recycling it, um, losing a bunch of it, and losing the quality as well. So, so the, the result of plastics recycling today, again, is inherently unprofitable. It's really hard to make work as a business model, accepting certain forms like plasma gasification. I know a few people that are you know, doing that where they'll, they'll gasify plastic that comes in, re-precipitate uh, re, uh, it, and then, and then create a resin. Um, that has the potential to be profitable. It's not profitable today, uh, but you know, with maybe some improvements, it, it'll get there. Um, but you know, back to the idea of of nationalizing uh, recycling, um, if it was run as a service provided by government, sort of like the post office, a service expected to lose money, but provide uh, a sustainable outcome or provide a positive social outcome, um, I, I think that you'd see that number, you know, 95% of plastics don't get recycled, uh, go down sharply, right? Like, like put it in the hands of somebody who does not have a profit motive and you'll see much higher volumes uh, of, of material being recycled. So I think that's really important. Um, you know, we can't keep consuming. Uh, I mean, we can, but we're going to run out of everything. Um, you know, time on the environment, oil, um, you know, everything. And, and we're gonna make this planet uninhabitable for us. So I know that it's painful to, to see an industry that, that wants to innovate, um, that, that wants to get better, um, you know, kind of go away in the private market. But, um, you know, I, I'm not a giant fan of nationalization in general, but when you've got something that doesn't work and hasn't been working as a for-profit business, you have to, you know, only an insane person would keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So I think, um, I think pulling that in uh, as a government service enables us to, to not worry about process loss and not worry about the reduction in material utility. It makes polymer available for use uh, you know, by, by other businesses. So that capital that would have previously gone into recycling can go into businesses that will now make things out of that recycled plastic, um, which, which you know, benefits all of us. So let's go deeper a bit now on, uh, into uh, applied bioplastics. Um, if you can just quickly uh, summarize for us like the, the origin of the, the story between you and your co-founder and how uh, you guys started with like to you know, uh, work and, uh, around the, the, this idea and the initial uh, prototype that uh, you had at that time. Certainly. So um, my uh, co-founder and I have lived together for almost seven years now. Um, and so we, we met because we were both looking for roommates. Um, you know, I was, as I said earlier in sales, he was, um, you know, a computer engineer doing deployments for hospitals and banks. Um, you know, he has a degree in finance and, um, international marketing as well, but, um, decided that, you know, kind of business was not, um, as challenging for him as he, as he had wanted. So he went into his, uh, minor, um, you know, he got a minor in computer engineering. So anyways, um, so we lived together for a while, became great friends. Um, when I came back from my uh, Bangladesh trip, uh, you know, working with the refugees and, and meeting Dr. Khan and finding out about his housing solution, I came home and I said, you know, I 
can't believe I'm saying this. I, I made nearly a million dollars, uh, you know, working at my job this year. Um, I want to quit and I want to start a business. And, uh, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I got a degree in rhetoric, right? Like I have a liberal arts degree, um, you know, and, and not to not to crap on that or anything. Uh, but, you know, this is a chemistry company. Um, everybody who works for me is substantially more educated than me. I, I'm the only one with a single degree. Uh, everybody else is at least two bachelors, if not two bachelors and a master's, two bachelors, and a master's and a PhD. Right. So, um, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just know that my my heart and my gut says um, that, you know, I can be more fulfilled by running a company that's trying to save the world um, or at minimum put houses over, put roofs over heads. Right. Um, and, you know, he, on the other hand, was was also making really good money and had really decent benefits at at, at his firm. And, you know, it was a tough decision for both of us. We, we actually kind of worked in secret on the business for about six months before deciding uh, that it was viable, that we could do it. We had a good plan um, and and that we were going to quit our jobs and, and start the company. Um, so that was like June of 2019 after after working on it for about uh, six months. So on the product side, if you can uh, tell us and, and walk, walk us through the, the, the process, I mean, how does it work? Uh, what are the bio-based raw materials that you guys are using? How long does it take? I mean, what uh, if you can really like walk us through the, the process and help to visualize where are you guys at today and maybe from what you started, um, you know, if you can, you know, uh, help us to understand your, uh, your secret sauce. Certainly. So we started out with uh, a lab in Bangladesh that we rented. Um, it was really just a you know a room that we filled with equipment and and a few people. And um, you know we we have expanded our operations. Um, you know we now have a, a second lab in, in India um, where we you know in those two places we make our housing material in Bangladesh and we make our treated uh, fiber in 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 India. Um, we, we utilize a number of partners so that we were able to scale without uh, doing capital expenditures. Um, we've broken out our IP into multiple steps so that we can, you know, flexibly use contract manufacturers to make our material without committing to a particular location yet, although we do plan to do that in the very near future. Um, we now have 20 employees. Um, about half are in um, R&D, about a quarter are in uh, sales, and then the, the last quarter is uh, leadership and administration. Um, you know, as far as the secret sauce goes, um, you know, it's it's really the the knowledge of the people that are on board. I mean, we have the Lifetime Achievement Award winner in biocomposites. We've got four plastics PhDs besides him. Um, you know, we've got one other person that's one class away from their PhD. Um, so we're going to be up to like six uh, by, by the, you know, sometime next year. Um, and, and so, you know, with all of that collective knowledge and plastics, um, we're able to quickly, uh, create formulations that work for different manufacturers. Um, as you may be aware, um, there's no such thing as a truly like virgin plastic pellet. I mean, they exist, but they're never used in manufacturing. Typically, um, in like 99% of cases, um, that plastic goes to a business called a compounder. And the compounder's job is to put in the things that make the plastic ready for injection molding. So we're talking UV stabilizers, so the plastic doesn't degrade in sunlight, fire retardants, so that it doesn't catch fire, uh, colorants, so that it is the right color, uh, plasticizers or, or stiffeners, so that it has the, the right bending and, and you know touch properties and stuff like that. Um, so we go in as a co-feed stock at the compounder level. So essentially, you know, there's plastic from Exxon and there's cellulose from us and they meet at the compounder, um, you know, along with all the other additives. So what we've done is develop an additive package, um, basically a toolkit that enables us to create an additive package for any given application. So as a result of that, we're able to cover about 80% of durable polypropylene use cases. And when we release our polyethylene next year, we'll immediately be able to meet about 50% of polyethylene use cases. And then we're hoping to extend that to a similar 80 to 90% uh, by the end of, of uh, 2023. So that's really the secret sauce is, is A, the inherent knowledge in, in, our, in our team and B, the ability to quickly iterate a 
base plastic that we've created to meet a multitude of use cases. Um, the other piece here that's really important is that, you know, we don't want to be the plastic pellet creator forever. We're doing it today because we need we needed to prove product market fit. We've now done that. We've got multiple customers. We've got a distributorship agreement running. We're starting to get into recurring revenue. We're proving that these plastic pellets are desired by injection molders and the people who pay them to create parts. Um, the next step, however, is to take that secret sauce that I just described and apply it to to plastics makers as a whole. So what we want is the compounders themselves to license our technology from us. Um, you know, we want the plastics makers, uh, you know, at the top of the chain to license our technology from us. We want them uh, to understand how to successfully combine plant material with their plastics because trying to outscale, uh, you know, Shell or Dow or, you know, you know, BASF or, or Mitsubishi Chemical is the, the work of decades. Right. That's not what we're going for. Um, you know, we don't want to be a plastic pellet producer. We want to be a, you know, a technology provider. Um, and, and what we can do with that is teach folks how to do the compounding step, uh, which is patented. Right. Like so that's we're, we're going to be licensing that patent and we'll keep the fiber treatment process in house as a trade secret. So that's that's how we're protecting our IP. That's kind of our moat. And then once we license the compounding technology to our licensees, we'll be the ones selling them the treated fiber, right? So we have a, a you know a dual income stream from each of our licensees in perpetuity. Um, that way, we don't have to touch the end customer. We just rely on their existing customer base um, and and provide them with better biomaterials. So when you mentioned that um, you know this proprietary uh, cellulose based. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about like their specificity and where do you source them and and how do you plan to uh, in a way uh, adjust uh, the logistics effort uh, to supply those millions of tons of uh, of potential uh, quantity of plastics or bioplastics or cellulose to use that that will be required. Certainly. So this is um, the, firstly great question. Secondly, this is what kills most bioplastics companies um, is they rely on a single source of cellulose. Um, and if something happens with that, say that, you know, whether uh, it's a weather event or somebody, you know, discovers a secondary use case for it and then the price goes up massively, um, you know, that is why there's a trail of dead bodies in the biomaterials space because it's it's hard right like you know especially if you're beholden to a single source of cellulose so we're not we are fiber agnostic and the criteria that we use to decide on our fiber is this we use um you know fair trade fiber we, we buy it at fair trade prices uh we ensure that it is grown water efficiently on marginal land which means no de deforestation um, in emerging economies, primarily because we're able to enrich those communities. There's more, more of a social benefit. Um, but all that said, um, you know, we use everything from rotational crops uh, to agricultural waste uh, to intentionally farmed fibers. I'll give you an example of some of the intentionally farmed fibers. Uh, we're working with two different businesses today that make two different types of bioengineered grass and cane. Um, those grasses and canes are meant to clean up uh, brownfield industrial sites. So they plant the, you know, the, the factory goes away, but all the pollution's still there. You know, you plant these grasses and canes over top of the site. They suck up all the, the bad stuff and turn it into a greenfield agricultural place to do it, right? So there's additional chemical benefits to that. There's additional, um, you know, social benefits to that and it can increase rather than de decrease food production. Another good example is um, water hyacinth and carrizo cane. These are both invasive species. They reduce food output. They deoxygenate lakes and rivers. Um, really bad for the environment, um, just like most invasive species. Um, you know, in some cases, governments will pay us to take that away for them and, you know, turn it into biomaterials. So that's a that's another source we have. And then we go all the way down to like responsibly sourced wood, right? Like like everything from lawn clippings all the way down the chain to, you know, something that I think is like, man, you know, I'd rather not use wood because wood is a great carbon sequesterer on its own. Um, so, you know, that's um, but but yeah, we run the gamut. And, and the cool thing about that is that, you know, we're able to source our cellulose 
on any continent that is currently inhabited by humans, you know, other than Antarctica, which I know there's humans there, but not very many. Um, so, you know, we, we are able to source um, these natural fibers because humans have been planting these natural fibers since the dawn of agriculture, right? I mean, like, you know, everything from rough spun to burlap to, you know, the cotton that you, that's in your shirt right now, um, we've been making natural fibers for quite some time. And as a result, there's a great deal of agricultural waste associated with that. Um, you know, rotational crops for food is another big thing. Um, and um, and hang on, let me uh, say that again. All right, sorry about that. I'm back. Um, what was I saying? I was saying, what was the last thing I said? I can't hear you. You're muted as well. Uh, you're, you're mentioning uh, about like um, uh, fibers has been like produced, but let, let, let's just zoom out a little bit because I'm trying to understand like the, the model that you're presenting to me. And indeed, uh, which is very, sounds very interesting and promising is like this large palette of like uh, potentials in terms of like all of those, you know, type of fibers that can be collected thanks to your model from and so many different sources, but how do you see your, your next step in terms of the models when you go in a way outside of the uh, the lab scale uh, and more like at the commercial side um, with the model that you described uh, prior to me in terms of like uh, licensing uh, on one part, uh, the model to those uh, large uh, plastic manufacturer and on the other side, uh, yourself providing uh, those cellulose based mixed uh, that you guys collect. So how do you see is is would it be like decentralized small units uh, collecting yes, from you, uh, small? You've nailed it already. Yeah, you, you, you already nailed it. it it's um, essentially our model relies on the fact that in order to treat our fiber, we only use standard equipment that can be purchased anywhere in the world. Um, so no specialized equipment goes into this, which means we can scale rapidly and anywhere. Right. So um, what I need in each facility, and this is all I need, is a grinder a dual reaction chamber, which is a fancy name for an enclosed bucket with a hose between it, right? Um, and an oven. And that's it. That's all I need in any facility. Preferably, we have a roof on the facility and a power source, but that's about it, right? So that can be built anywhere at, you know, very small scale, like say you want to, you know, you want to serve village by village in, you know, it, agricultural societies, we can do that. Right. Like we can get a desktop size grinder, a very small dual reaction chamber and a very small oven. It won't cost us very much, probably, you know, under like 20 or thirty thousand dollars for for just those things. Right. Um, and, and serve a small village. Or if we're in a place where there's you know ton of centralized agriculture as well as off takers for us, we're going to spend you know a million dollars on a scaled version of those three items or multiple you know medium versions of those three items, right? So it enables us to accurately you know plan for scale, you know, because we're we're doing these licensing agreements. What would be more difficult is if we were doing you know pure pellet sales like most plastic companies. The way that's usually purchased is spot pricing, right? Whatever's the lowest price and nearest buy, you buy that, right? Um, that doesn't help us predict our demand very well. So really, truly, licensing is the key to our success because it enables us uh, to understand our demand before we establish the, the, uh, the facilities. And then we can build facilities that are scaled to that demand. If that same demander, if that same licensee wants to expand their usage, they need to tell us that. Um, and then we can add machines uh, to to the you know the same facility that they're already using. So it's it's super modular, super scalar, uh, scalable. Excuse me. And and you know if one of those licensees goes away, these are not machines that are bolted into the ground, right? Like we can pick them up and move them uh, to where they're wanted, right? And and so this is really key to understand here. One of the main you know places where biomaterials companies fall down is that they have to source cellulosic material somehow, right? And cellulosic material is inherently low bulk density. So basically imagine stuffing a bunch of grass into a shipping container. It's not gonna be super dense, right? Like you can't compress that very well. Um, and so that shipping container is not gonna be very valuable 
but you still have to ship it, right? Um, so that sucks um, because you're, you're, you're spending way more on shipping and on CO2 associated with shipping um, than you're going to get value out of the biomaterials that you've gathered. So by, by placing our treatment facilities very close to the sources of cellulose, we're able to clean, dry, treat, and densify the material on site, put it into a shipping container, and then... And in a much denser and more valuable format, it's able to go to the compounder where it's turned into the final pellet that gets injection molded, right? So, um, you know, we've taken great pains to keep our supply chain short um, and sustainable and high bulk density wherever it's possible to do that. So going back to the uh, plastic manufacturer, of, I mean, I would say not like the ExxonMobil of this world, but uh, the one who are using the pellets and uh, doing this uh, molding and, uh, and, 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 and really the, the grinding and the mix that, uh, that you are describing and where you guys uh, uh, jump into the process. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about like who are they and what was the, in a way, the, the initial challenges that you had to, uh, to, to, to face uh, to, to, convince them, to convince them in a way to, uh, uh, to, to, to seek and, and get the interest of, uh, of your solution? So you're talking about our customers? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting. We have a massive pipeline. Um, and, and I think that the reason that we have a massive pipeline is because everybody wants better biomaterials um, or, or everybody wants better materials. Let's put it that way. Right. Like like the climate is top of mind for nearly every major business, for nearly every major government, for the vast majority of people on the planet, especially people who are our age. You know, we're thinking, what's going to happen to my children or my neighbor's children in my case? Right. Like what, what's going to happen um, in the next generation or two? Um, and, and as the generations that, that cared less about the environment or understood less uh, uh, you know, about the environment are, are moving into retirement, um, and, and folks like us, you know, the Gen Xers, the, 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 uh, the millennials are taking positions in, in these businesses, positions of authority, um, you see the priorities shifting, right? And, and, um, and so we've been reached out to a lot uh, by, by businesses, right? Like we're not doing a ton of ac active prospecting. We have two salespeople in India um, that are, are selling into a market that already has regulations requiring biomaterials or recycled materials to be used um, simply because we just don't have the reputational reach over there yet. Um, but like in general, when we're talking to American firms, it's through word of mouth. Um, you know, because, you know, companies that manufacture stuff talk to each other um, and they're all looking for better materials. Um, so that's that's the first thing is, is, you know, there aren't a ton of challenges in terms of getting in front of customers. The challenges that we have seen, however, are the brand manufacturers want to use better materials, but often they've outsourced their parts manufacturing. Right. So, for instance, um, say like uh, um, Amazon, right? Amazon makes. Uh, these speakers and these tablets and stuff like that, but they really only do the final assembly and the software, right? They don't do the parts injection molding, right? So if I were to go talk to Amazon and, and I have, um, and I'm not like calling them out here because I think that, you know, they, they clearly care. They've got the Amazon climate pledge, all that good stuff. They're working on making their packaging a lot more sustainable, um, but they cannot adopt our material. They can't um, because they don't buy plastic. Right. They they pay somebody else to manufacture parts so that they can assemble the final product. That manufacturer, the one that, that you know, injection molds the parts is the buyer for us. So we actually spun our wheels for like a year talking to these big brands, getting them really excited about using our plastic and then getting to procurement and realizing on both ends. Wait, we don't actually buy plastic. Oops. Who do we buy plastic from? You know, or like, you know, who? Who buys the plastic for us? And then, you know, so then we have to go to this this, you know, phase where the large influential business is trying to get their injection molder to listen to us to adopt their plastic. And that's worked sometimes and that hasn't worked most of the time. Right. So what we've done is we've we've refocused our efforts directly on those parts manufacturers, on those injection molders and have found way more. Or success. I mean, I'm kind of kicking myself today because I feel as though had a, had we made this realization a year ago, we would have been post revenue, you know, eight months ago, um, and and we're just getting to that stage now because we mistargeted. Um, you know, we didn't understand our industry well enough uh, to to target the right customers, but we fixed that now and we're on our way. 
So and thanks for for sharing all of that. So in, in terms of like the the economics, I mean you, you're mentioning that you guys are getting like uh, close to to post uh, revenue now. Uh, if you could like uh, tell us a bit more, like um, you know what is the cost uh, of um, you know injecting and using your applied uh, bioplastics into this mix uh, with the, the the regular plastic in itself, like the outcome product i mean how more expensive or cheaper what is the green premium here compared to uh someone who's applying just the regular uh you know plastic solution that uh, is available uh, so uh, Guillaume, my, today? my thesis and this is going to be true for any business i ever run including applied bioplastics my thesis is that if you want worldwide adoption you can't be more expensive bottom line you cannot be more expensive um and to think that you can charge a green premium is admitting to yourself that your product's not good enough for everybody else in the world who doesn't live in a, you know, uh, you know, cutting edge developed nation, right? You're saying to the world, if you're in, you know, Southeast Asia, or you're in Africa and you're in South America, I don't give a crap about you. I'm only here to sell to Europeans and, and, and Americans. Um, that's what green premium means to me is is that um is that you know you don't care about wide scale adoption you care about feeling good and i'm i apologize to any other founders who charge a, a green premium but like the the reality is that the world needs solutions um the whole world not just parts of it right so um you know when you look at our housing material no it's not as cheap as a tent but it is cheaper than fiberglass or tin right and it's also more sustainable right um when you look at our plastics um they're a commodity Commodities aren't viable if they're more expensive than the competition. They just aren't. Nobody's going to buy it, right? Like a, a large part of my customer base is in India where, you know, the the customers care, right? But the, does the injection molder care? No, they're not being regulated on, on, their, on their carbon emissions, right? So what benefit does it have to them to adopt our material other than you know, maybe getting a few more customers because they, they've got a sustainability story, right? Um, so for us, price parity is paramount. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, we have to be right there with petroleum based plastic in order to be viable for the entire world. Um, you know, the, the other piece is that, you know, for licensees, the, the dynamics are this is that plastic is beholden to oil pricing. However, there's inherent cost in turning oil into plastic. So, you know, if oil goes negative, plastic doesn't become zero. Um, it, it has a baseline of about twelve hundred dollars a metric ton. Right. Um, when oil goes up, though, plastic goes up. And right now oil is up because of a number of factors. But, you know, you've got OPEC cutting cutting production. Um, you've got the war in Ukraine. Um, you know, you still have supply chain disruption uh, from from, from COVID. So there's a number of reasons why, um, you know, plastic is high right now and oil is high right now. Um, but for us, you know, those things don't change the cost of our natural fibers. Um, you know, there are very few things that do because we are source agnostic on the cellulose. I mean, I can use corn husk, ramy sea salt, um, you know, coconut husk. I can use uh, jute and hemp and core. Um, you know, I, there's there's a million uh, things that I can use. And so if there's a price shock in one of them, I'm just going to switch feedstocks. Right. So what compare, that... uh, and so to interrupt, if you compare like the, the price per metric tons, uh, both of them, uh, and I totally understand the, the, the concept of green premium that you mentioned before, but purely as of today, without being at scale, where are you at? And at yeah. scale, what's the projection that you have? So uh, I was definitely getting to that. So essentially, um, because the biomaterials, the cellulose that we source is so much less expensive than plastic, when we cut out, say, half the plastic and replace it with something cheaper, that's where we generate our margin, right? Because we're still selling that at price parity, but the inputs were cheaper, right? So that's where our margin is today. Um, when we start licensing our technology early next year, um, we're going to share some of that margin with plastics producers because they're used to having to buy a bunch of plastic and their additive package. We're gonna sell them the fiber and additive package and a bunch of, you know, and somebody else is gonna sell them the plastic. They can put those two things together and sell it at commodity pricing while getting, you know, say a 5% higher margin. And that's significant. I want to point that out because, um, you know, commodity plastic, typically it's under 1% in profit. Um, so if I can say I'm going to add 5% to your margin as a plastic producer, you've got a serious incentive on your main line of business 
uh, to change, right? So um, as far as at scale versus now, our pricing is our pricing um, and our pricing is, is uh, you know, commensurate with the market. Like we sell our plastic at the same price that the market sells plastic. Um, in the future, you know, if we make improvements in our process, if we scale and are able to do this cheaper, we're either gonna capture that margin ourselves or we're going to, uh, you know, share that margin with plastics producers to incentivize them, or we may eventually go to a competitive pricing model where we're not only meeting the price of regular plastic, but we're beating the price of regular plastic in order to get more adoption. So what's, uh, what's next for uh, Applied Bioplastics and what keeps you uh, up at night right now? Not much as far as the second question. Um, we've just uh, uh, closed our pre-seed round um, literally Friday. Um, so we are well funded for the next phase. Um, the, the next phase is a crowd fundraise. So I'm really glad that we're talking today because I'd like to, to point out that you can go to raisegreen.com. Um, we have an indication of interest campaign that is ending in one week. Um, that is going to turn into an actual crowd fund by the end of the month. Um, you know, minimum investment, I believe is $1,000. Uh, you can help be part of the, the, the future of polymers, uh, by, by heading over to raise green, indicating your interest. Um, you know, we'd love to have you as an investor. Um, and in general, and I do want to say one thing about crowdfunding here is, is um, you know, I want to be beholden to the people. I want to be beholden to the world as far as what we do uh, with our technology, um, what we do with our pricing. Um, you know, I want people to hold me accountable uh, to, to everything I've been saying today, that, that building housing is important, that decarboni decarbonizing is important, that avoiding deforestation is important. And I think, and not to turn off any investor that might be listening, but you know, I think that it, a lot of the time, uh, venture capital money comes with this expectation uh, of growth at all costs. I think the same thing goes for going public is that you're expected to create as much profit as possible with little consideration uh, for the environment, for social good, for other things like that. So the reason that we're doing a crowdfunding raise is to give the people an opportunity to join us. Um, you know, to, to hold us accountable, to be our basically our public board, right? I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear about, um, you know, what you think of our strategies. I want to hear that you believe that what we're doing is 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 moral and right for the world. Um, and so I encourage you again, please visit raisegreen.com, look for applied bioplastics there and join our crowd fundraise. After that, um, you know, we are, are going to be uh, closing down all fundraising for the rest of 23, most likely. Um, we may do, do a seed round close to the end of the year if we decide it's time for just absolutely massive scale. But that crowdfund gets us through one million in uh, recurring revenue. Uh, that enables us to to be profitable on a per unit basis. Um, that enables us to get to the next step and really start scaling this thing like bananas. So that that's what's coming up for us. Would love to see how we can uh, help you in the in the future for sure. Uh, last question on uh, on my side, more on the personal side, but. Uh, I mean, what's your uh, personal opinion on the on the climate crisis? And it's a question that I ask to uh, every guest and in, in the show. I mean, are we doomed? Or what would you tell to, to people who feel uh, demoralized by you know all of those uh, terrible consequences that we uh, already see and feel today? Uh, what would you tell them? I think that our way of life, and by that I mean the the unthinking consumerism. Um, by that, I mean the, the comfort at all costs um, it is doomed. I think that if we don't take, you know, I mean, we're past the point of no return as far as the ice caps melting, right? So um, there are going to start being irreversible effects um, that we've already caused. And, and, and there's very little we can do to roll that back. Um, I think that there's hope, though. I, you know, I think that you know, applied bioplastics is part of one of the solutions. Um, I'm encouraged by uh, the news coming out of Greentown Labs, Houston and Boston. Um, there's, you know, I know a company that's working on cold fusion. I mean, we're talking free energy forever, right? Um, and, and so, you know, with the right incentives, with your, you know, I mean, if you're feeling demoralized, write your senator. You know, uh, you know, call, call your congressman, um, you know, if you're not in the U.S., um, you know, speak to your representatives. I mean, the, the initiatives adopted at, at uh, COP27 this year were, were toothless. Um, you know, they're just trying to decide 
who the cost of greenifying is going to land on. And, and that's that's pathetic. We can do better than that. And, and we should do better than that. So, you know, get involved. Um, you know, there's a there's a great uh, protest group called Extinction Rebellion in uh, in Europe. Uh, if you're a young person, you feel like you want to get out there and make a difference. I would look them up, um, you know, again, get involved, vote, most importantly, uh, for, for people who espouse uh, the, the same beliefs as you on, on, the, on the crisis. And I was really disappointed to see the turnout here in Texas for the midterm elections. But, um, but look, the, there's a lot of things that a lot of people need to be doing. Um, governments need to be subsidizing. Governments need to be um, you know, pulling back subsidies uh, from, uh, um, you know, from, from oil and gas and giving them to, to sustainable solutions. Uh, cold fusion needs to get all of the funding in the world um, because we can cut our you know, emissions on energy to zero if we can do that. Um, there's, there's, there is hope. What there's not hope for is mindless consumerism forever. Um, what there's not hope for is, uh, you know, endless growth forever, as theorized by, you know, the you know, market economic fans, right? Like, like we cannot have endless growth forever until we figure out how to do it sustainably, because you're going to see the bottom drop out eventually and all those gains are going to go away. So, you know, let's stop focusing on quarter to quarter profits and talk about what social good, what environmental good can be gleaned from these companies while still providing goods and services that everybody enjoys. So again, there is hope. There's a lot of work to do though. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, any question that I should have asked you that I didn't and uh, how can we help you or the listeners on the show, investors, founders, experts can uh, help apply the plastic today? Yeah, I mean, you know, spread the word. We, um, you know, if you run a startup that makes something physical um, out of plastic, we want to hear from you. If you run a company that makes physical products out of plastic, we want to hear from you. Um, if you are a listener, um, I'm sure you have been bombarded by all kinds of asks to invest. Um, I would say that my minimum investment is lower given that I'm doing a crowdfund. So if you've got a thousand dollars burning a hole in your pocket, we would love to have you uh, as part of the climate fight at raisegreen.com looking for applied bioplastics. Um, and then, you know, start at base camp. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, I really enjoy talking to you guys. I think this is the second time, um, you know, I think that uh, what you do is really important in getting new ideas uh, out there and, and, and highlighting founders. So thank you, uh, Guillaume, for, for doing this and, and for having me today. Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, your time, your uh, super valuable insights on the uh, on the industry, uh, this hard work that you put and, uh, and passion on what you do uh, with Applied Plastic. So uh, really, really super happy that uh, we had uh, you on the show. Uh, thank you so much and uh, congrats on the, the recent uh, closing rounds. Good luck on the on the new uh, crowdfunding that you're putting together and uh, really excited to, to follow uh, more about you guys. Thank you so much, Gian. Hi, it's Guillaume again. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. As I said, do not hesitate to share an episode with a friend. Also, if you value the work we do for the climate tech ecosystem, here is how you can contribute to it. Today, I'm asking for your support and a donation or sponsorship to make the work of our self-funded team more viable. Even a small contribution means a lot to us. In any case, I will invite you to subscribe to our channels and visit our website startupdiscamp.org to discover more episodes like this one. And get your membership to access all our members' exclusive content. So remember, all of this is possible because of your support and donation. And we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. Let's keep in touch and I hope you will enjoy our next show with us. 